What's up, YouTube? So today we're going to be talking about the top five ways that I own your internal network. Now I'm going to be giving this talk over the next month or two. I have a few slots that have, I've been booked for this talk, and I just kind of wanted to give a nice little condensed version of the talk. So in case you don't get to see it or anything like that, I want to break it down. Instead of a 45-minute talk that I'll be doing in person, kind of break it down into a 5 to 10, maybe 15-minute talk about the common ways that I own internal networks and how you can do it yourself and how you can protect against it. So we won't waste a lot of time. As always, if you like the video, please do hit subscribe, hit that like button, and of course hit the bell if you wanna get notifications for future videos. Let's go ahead and just dive right in. All right, so before we get started, it's important to note that these are my top five. Every pen tester has his or her methodology and his or her favorite attacks. These are the ones that I see the most often. It doesn't mean that they're the newest or latest and greatest. They're the ones that most commonly work for me. They're all Active Directory based because if, again, if you've never watched my channel, 90 to 95% of the Fortune 500 companies out there use Active Directory. So when you're pen testing an internal network, you're gonna see Active Directory attacks a great majority of the time. So let's go ahead and dive into our first attack, which is LLMNR slash MBTNS poisoning. So quickly, let's identify what is LLMNR. So LLMNR stands for Link Local Multicast Name Resolution. Basically, it's used to identify hosts when DNS fails to do so. It is previously known as MBTNS, and still to this day, if LLMNR fails, then MBTNS kicks in. Uh, a key flaw of LLMNR is that it the service utilizes a user's username and their NTLMv2 hash when they're appropriately responded to. So we're going to use a tool called Responder to appropriately respond to these, these requests and see what we can do with it. A brief overview of the attack looks something like this. Now we have a victim and the victim is saying, hey, I want to connect to this HackMe server, but it's spelled incorrect. It's HackM and this creates a DNS issue. And the server says, I have no idea what you're talking about. For whatever reason, DNS isn't working here. So it's going to send out an LLMNR broadcast. It's going to say, hey, does anybody know how to connect to this? And as a hacker or attacker sitting in the middle of this attack, we're going to say, I do. Go ahead and send me over your hash and I'll connect it to you, that server. So the victim is going to say, OK, here you go. Here's my hash. Let's take a look at what that looks like in real life. Now to run Responder, we navigate to the Responder folder that's built into Kali Linux, and we run this command here, python responder.py, interfaces tunnel zero, that's what I'm listing on over a VPN, and then we set a few flags, hit enter, and now we are listening for events on our network. You can see here that we have listening servers up and poisoners for LMNR, MBTNS, etc. Now from the victim side, let's say we do have an incident. We're going to trigger an event here. So I'm just going to point this at my attacker machine. And then we're going to switch back into the Kali machine. And you will notice that we now have captured a hash. This hash is a NTLM v2 hash. You can see the domain is Marvel and the user is Frank Castle. So now all we have to do is copy this hash and we can put it into a text file and try to run it through Hashcat. All right, and with Hashcat brought up on my Windows machine, we're going to go ahead and run Hashcat with a module of 5600, which stands for NTLMv2. Stored inside hashes2.txt is the hash that we just copied and captured, and rocky.txt is the very common word list. So we're going to go ahead and just hit enter on this, and it's going to take a second here, should trigger, and crack our password. Okay, so our password cracked here in just a few seconds, and we can see that the very bad password of password1 is being used by this user. So from an attacker perspective, what we're doing is we're sitting here and we're listening in the middle for any of these sort of events. We're trying to capture these hashes. If we can capture these hashes, we're going to take them either offline and try to crack them, and uh, or the other option is to try to relay them, which you're going to see here in a minute. So with these passwords, if you have a weak password policy, that's going to ding you. And while we're talking about that, let's go ahead and bring up the defenses against this. 
So mitigation, the best defense is actually to disable LLMNR and NVTNS. Now I've got how to do it here. These are just group policy settings or network adapter settings. You have to disable both. If you disable LLMNR, it will default to NVTNS. Now for some reason, if you cannot disable uh, LLMNR and NVTNS in your network, the second best options are to require network access control. So if somebody plugs into your network, uh, you know, it makes it a little harder for them to get onto the network and perform these man in the middle attacks. The other option is to use stronger passwords, for example, 14 characters in length or longer, or limit your common password usage or common word usage. So you shouldn't be using common words unless you're using a very long sentence or something like that. I've cracked passwords up to 19 characters long uh, is I think my record because they use biblical verses and pass that through and we cracked it pretty easily. Uh, so don't think that a common word just because it's long is gonna still be safe. You should mix uh, up your characters and really even using a password manager or something along those lines is even more secure. But the longer, the better, the harder it is for someone like me to crack these passwords. All right, moving on to the second way that I own your internal network. I like to call this pass the password or pass the hash. So what are this? This is when we crack a password like we just did with the LLMNR poisoning, or and or we can dump SAM hashes, we can leverage both of those for lateral movement in networks. Let's take a look at what this looks like. All right, to do this, we're going to be using a tool called Crack Map Exec. Now here we're using Crack Map Exec against the whole subnet of 10.0.3.0 WAC24 and we're going to use our user of fcastle and our domain of marvel and the password of password1. These are all what we just gathered and cracked that hash of just a second ago. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to try to pass the password around the network. Okay, and you can see anywhere that it says pwned, that is a machine that not only do we have access to, we have administrative access to. So Punisher at dot seven is one that we already own. This is where we grabbed the hash from originally and we captured the hash, passed the password around. Well, our user F Castle also has access on this Spider-Man machine at dot six, meaning that he is an admin on Punisher and an admin on Spider-Man. We could take his password and leverage that to gain a shell on these machines. Now I'm gonna go ahead and gain a shell and then we're gonna look at pass the hash. Okay, so I booted up Metasploit and I'm using a tool called psexec. In that tool, I went ahead and set the domain, the password, the user, and the IP address of the machine we're attacking. I also set the payload to be a 64-bit meterpreter, reverse TCP payload. Scroll down, session one died, that's okay. And then I got a new session on session two and I ran hash dump. Now, as we are, we could also say get UID and you could see that we are authority system just by cracking a hash that we captured via the LLMNR poisoning. So we own one system and now we actually technically own two systems because we saw previously that we were able to get into Spider-Man. We could also run this attack against Spider-Man and leverage another shell. So here we can leverage something called hash dump and dump all the local hashes on the machine now these local hashes, you can see that the first bits are all the same. That's okay, we're actually after the second part here. So it looks like there's a user F castle as well. And I'm just gonna copy this hash. And I can use crack map exec again if I come over here. I've got the same parameters as last time, user of F castle and then a capital H for a hash. I'm gonna hit paste. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna say dash dash local to try local attacks here and pass that around the network. Now you can see it didn't get me into any other machines than the one I'm already in. That's perfectly fine. But this is something that we see commonly in the field is where I am able to pass a local admin password and get into every single machine because they're using the same admin password for every build. Very, very bad juju, right? That will get me every single machine in your network, probably not your domain controller, but with enough machines, enough access, as you're gonna see here in a little bit, I'll probably own your domain controller. So let's look at some of the mitigations for this. So it is hard to completely prevent these sorts of attacks, but we can make it very difficult on an attacker. 
For one, we should limit account reuse, meaning that we should avoid reusing the local admin password as you just saw. We should disable guest and administrator accounts. We should also limit who is a local administrator. Now, this might drive some people nuts and you might get an influx of tickets on help desk, but it's for better security. Not everybody in your organization should be a local administrator, although they all want to be. Very dangerous, that's how bad things happen. Also, utilizing strong passwords, the longer the better. If I can't crack this password and gain leverage, then you know I don't even get this far in the attack. So avoid using common words again, and I like to use long sentences again, so if you can make a 40 character password out of a long sentence, even better. There are also tools out there called PAM or Privilege Access Management. Those check out and check in sensitive accounts when needed, so you'll just log into a platform, say, hey, I wanna use this account. It'll rotate a password, give you that password and access, and then after, say, eight hours, it'll check that account back in and rotate the password again. So this limits these sort of pass attacks, the pass the hash, hash pass the password, etc. as these are usually stronger passwords between 15 and 30 characters, and they are constantly rotated. All right, let's talk about our third item on the list, and we're going to do a little mixture of live demo on this one and a little bit of PowerPoint. So the third one is called token impersonation. Now, what are tokens? Tokens are temporary keys that allow you uh, system or network access without having to provide your credentials. They're basically cookies for computers. Okay, there are two types of tokens. There's a delegate token and an impersonate token. Now, if you log into something like remote desktop, you're using a delegate token. If you're doing something non-interactive, like a attaching a network drive through a logon script, you're using an impersonate token. So let's go ahead and take a look at token impersonation and then we'll look at some slides as to why it's dangerous. All right, so back to our interpreter shell. You see we did a Git UID and we are authority system. Now we can try to impersonate a user on the machine. We could say something like load incognito, which is a token impersonation tool. And then we could say list tokens by user. See what tokens are available. And there is a user of Marvel F Castle here. We can copy that or just say impersonate token Marvel F Castle like this. And we go into a shell and we say, who am I? And you can see that we are Marvel slash F Castle. We have impersonated a user for all intents and purposes. We are that user as of right now. So let's take a look at why this is dangerous. So as you saw, we just popped a shell and loaded incognito. We have impersonated our domain user and then let's try to run a malicious script. Now we're going to run invoke Mimi cats and we're going to do an LSA dump and try to dump all the NTLM hashes uh, on the domain controller. So we're gonna point this to the domain controller here. And as you can see, we are access denied because this user is not a domain administrator. Now, what if we were a domain administrator? So say, for example, Marvel administrator was logged into this computer and doing it remotely via remote desktop. Okay, we impersonate that user, and then we run this command again as a domain administrator. And guess what? Now we start pulling down hashes. We see the administrator hash here. We see the Kerberos ticket granting ticket hash, which is super important. Now that we have this hash, we can do something called a golden ticket attack we can create a golden ticket and we can own the domain controller, gain full access, and it's pretty much game over at this point. Just because we leveraged a domain administrator who logged into an, a computer with their credentials that was not a domain controller. Okay, let's talk mitigation strategies. So you can limit the user and group token creation permissions. Uh, on top of that, my, my thought is that you should be using account tiering. So meaning that if you are a domain administrator, you should have a regular account and a domain admin account. Now that domain admin account should only be logging into the domain controller. That way a situation like this where you're logging into a computer and we can impersonate a token never occurs. Uh, on top of that, you have to be a local administrator to actually pull off this token, uh, token impersonation. So if you limit the... Uh, the admin restriction, the local admin restriction, again, same thing with the least privilege, and I've, I've been harping on it, and I'm still going to harp on it uh, here in a few minutes, but local admin account restriction, least privilege, super important 
And you shouldn't be giving out, you know, local admin like it's candy, even if your users want it, it's just bad juju. So let's move on to the next one. Next up is SMB Relay. So think of SMB Relay as LLMNR poisoning. And instead of taking those hashes offline and cracking them, you can actually relay them without ever cracking them and gain shell access. Now, this is a super important vulnerability because if you have a 20 or 30 character password, guess what? It doesn't matter because we just say, hey, I am this person. Go ahead and just let me in. Now, why does this happen? Well, this happens because SMB signing is disabled. Now, it comes disabled by default on everything but domain controllers and or servers, right? So with SMB being disabled by default, we can pretty much move laterally across the network. Now, we can relay these user credentials as long as they are an admin on the machine. There are some things that we can do without being an administrator, but you will not be able to get a shell access without being that administrator account. So if you remember before in the lab, we had uh, a user, Frank Castle, who was able to get into not only the Punisher machine, but Spider-Man. So let's take a look at how instead of passing that with PS exec, we can go ahead and just do SMB relay attack. Okay, first things first, we're gonna use responder, but we have to use responder a little differently. So we're going to edit the responder.config file. And what we're gonna do is we're going to turn off SMB and HTTP servers. This will allow us, instead of capturing the hash, to actually relay the hash on. Once we have our configuration settings set up, we're gonna go ahead and run responder just like we did earlier. And if we scroll up briefly, we can see that HTTP server is off and SMB server is off as well. Now, this is going to be listening for events, though we won't see any events come through. We actually need to set up a second tool. Now that second tool is called NTLM Relay X.py. This is also part of the whole toolkit that Responder comes with. So this is called the Impacket Toolkit. So it also comes with NTLM Relay X and a bunch of other neat tools for internal pen testing. So here I'm using NTLM Relay X. It's going to be doing uh, the relay of the hash that comes through to Responder. It's going to point it towards a target file. In the targets.txt, I just specified Spider-Man's machine, which I would have identified via an Nmap scan or a Nessa scan that said, hey, this is vulnerable or doesn't have SMB signing enabled, so it's vulnerable to this sort of attack. And then I'm gonna go ahead and hit enter. And now it's going to be listening as well. So once responder catches something, it's going to send it over to NTLM Relay. That's gonna send that over and it's going to try to get a shell. So let's go ahead and take a look at what happens. So I'm gonna trigger an event again. And then going back into our machine, you can see that it sent over two hashes, but that's okay. You can see the attack succeeded. We're authenticating against dot six from dot seven. We're using the hash of F castle. We're not using a password here. And what is it doing? It is dumping the local SAM hashes for this account. You could see Peter Parker here, who is a 500 account. That means he's the local admin. Look, we're dumping his hash. We can grab that and try to pass it around. Now you see that we don't fully have a shell here. That's okay. We can improve upon this if we want to. And if you're interested, I do have a video on my channel. I'll link it down in the description below on how to actually gain a full shell using Empire with SMB Relay. But here we have proof concept. We have dumped the SAM hashes. So we can even get further lateral movement now without ever knowing the password. This password could have been 30 characters long and the attack would have worked just the same. So with that being said, let's talk about mitigation strategies. Well, first mitigation strategy is, okay, we can enable SMB signing on all devices. That is the recommendation. Uh, the pro is it completely stops the attack. Now the con is it can cause performance issues with file copies. The report is somewhere around 15% increase in time with file copies, especially on the larger side, though people were reporting even longer time periods with that. Uh, we could also disable NTLM authentication on the network. The pro to that is it will completely stop the attack. However, if Kerberos stops working, then Windows defaults back to NTLM and then you still have the same issue. Now, two that we've already talked about previously for other strategies come into play here as well. Account tiering. We limit the domain admin to specific tasks. 
but enforcing this policy might be difficult. So just in case we don't, you know, have a domain admin that we relay somewhere, it might not be to a domain controller, but it might get us onto a machine as a domain admin. And that's just bad news as well. Uh, same thing with this local admin restriction. You have to be an administrator in order to relay the account and get the shell access. If you are limiting the uh, local admin accounts with least privilege, the, the big pro there is you're going to prevent a lot of lateral movement. The con is you're probably going to see a potential increase in the amount of service desk tickets and the users complaining and needing help from service desk because they can't install something or do X, Y, Z. All right, and on to our last attack. That is Kerberosting. So if you don't know what Kerberos is, Kerberos is a computer network authentication protocol that works on the basis of tickets. So we authenticate using tickets. Now here you can see that we have a domain controller, a victim slash user, and we have the application server. Now let's talk about how a Kerberos works in general. So Kerberos has what's called a KDC or a key distribution center. That's the server. Now the client will ask the server, hey, can we have a ticket? Now the ticket is called a TGT or a ticket granting ticket. The server will check the credentials and if the credentials are good, it'll come back and it'll say, yeah, I'll give you a ticket. And that's what's called the TGS or ticket granting service. Now the secret key is stored on the client here. Now let's say that there is an application server like this. Now the application server can be something like SQL, antivirus, whatever you want it to be. Now application server has what's called a SPN or a service principal name. Now if you want to connect as a client, you take the service principal name and you take the ticket granting ticket and you ask for permission. The server will say, okay, yes, you can connect. Here is a session key. Now where Kerberosting is important and how we can utilize it is with any valid ticket granting ticket, any valid ticket, we can request a ticket granting service here for this SPN. So you're, it might not make full sense here, but once we take a look at it, it'll make a little bit more sense. Basically with any user account that has a valid Kerberos ticket, we can request uh, all the SPNs that are out there and potentially get their hashes. And we'll take a look at that. So let's look at a live demo. All right, so in our Kali machine now, we see that we are running Python and in the Impacket toolkit as well, we're running git user spns.py. We're gonna be using the user of Frank Castle with the password of password one. And we're requesting a ticket here from the DCIP of 10.0.3.4 that is our domain controller. So we hit enter, see what happens, and it pulls down a ticket. Remember, we are not a domain administrator. We are just a regular user. Well, we pull down this ticket here for the SQL service user. Now you can see that this user is a member of the domain admins group. This is a no-no in general. Your service account should not be part of the domain admin group, but you would be surprised by how many service accounts are. So we could take this hash and copy it and then attempt to crack it. Okay, so similar situation to before, I just took the hash and I put it into a file called kerberos.txt. I'm using module of 13100 and that is going to be a Kerberos ticket. And we're gonna go ahead and just hit enter on this against RockU. It's going to take a second to run and hopefully it will pull back a password for us. Okay, and we pulled back the password. You could see that we have the ticket here, same as what came through here. And it came back as my password, one, two, three pound. So what does this tell us? We need strong passwords, right? So let's talk about mitigation. All right, I already started kind of hinting at it, but strong passwords, really important here. If you're running service accounts, your service account should have very, very long passwords. They should not be common words. Again, I'm beating a dead horse, but it's important to have strong passwords. And again, it's important to have least privilege, right? So why on earth would a service account be a domain administrator account like we just saw? Who knows, but you see it all the time. So we can leverage these accounts either for lateral movement or if we get lucky and we find a domain administrator account that's also a service account, 
then guess what? We take that account and we crack it and we are a domain admin. All right, that's it. Hopefully this was informative for you. So these attacks, again, are super common and at least from my perspective, again, everybody has a different methodology. They have a different experience. Your mileage may vary. But for you aspiring red teamers and you blue teamers and you C-levels even, or you fresh business owners that are doing it on your own, you people that wear all the hats, these are things that you should be thinking about. These basic concepts that I just introduced and the, the ways to mitigate them will stop a lot of people in their tracks. It'll give you better security and you could just layer your security on top of that once you kind of get these foundations done. But if you skip the foundations, then you will find that even the basics like this, the basics of internal pen testing are still going to be the common way of attacks. So we topped out here around 20, 25 minutes. I know I said 15, but I really wanted to get these points across and really hammer it down and give some good live demos of this. Uh, so hopefully, again, you found this informative. If you liked it, please do tell a friend, share with a friend, hit the like, hit the bell, leave a comment down below. Uh, tell me I'm awesome. Tell me I suck. Either way, it's fine. Uh, until next time, I really, really do thank you for joining me, and I hope to see you in the next video.